what up, everybody? Happy Tuesday. It's another edition of the Orange Bloods Texas Football Channel. I'm Jeff Ketchum, joined, as always, by Anwar Richardson. We're talking Oklahoma football today, so do us a favor. Like the video, even though we're talking about the Sooner. Subscribe to the channel. Ring that bell. Get notifications. Do all of those things. Anwar, Big 12 Media Days begin tomorrow. You're getting ready to hit the road. Go to Arlington. There's a lot of stuff that we'll be talking about over the course of the next few days uh, with regards to the 2022 Big 12 season. Today, we're talking about all of the optimism that exists in Norman, Oklahoma, with this Sooners football team, this Sooners football program, under a new head coach in Brent Venables. And I got to be honest, like it really just hit me upside the head today how optimistic the Sooners are about their program, where they think Venables is taking it. And I don't completely understand why other than, you know, maybe we've seen it ourselves in the hires of Charlie Strong, Tom Herman, and even Steve Sarkeesian in Austin, that there's something about new that just kind of makes people lose their mind about what they think is possible on realistic timelines. What's interesting about it, Catch, is that there's almost been this like this turning on Lincoln Riley, who you and I have praised for years as you know one of the best uh, you know coaches in all of college football. I mean, we've said that on numerous occasions, uh, and we've put him up there usually every year in our, in our top two or three uh, for what he's been able to do. I mean, what was that? What was that run like? Six straight. Big 12 titles, that wasn't all under Lincoln. But, I mean, he made sure that program didn't go downhill. That's for damn sure. And it's almost like that he's it's, it's he's left. And it's almost like my new boo is better than my old boo. And it's like, yeah, 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 she, she was okay. But it's like, no, 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 you were saying your boo was amazing. And now you got your new boo. And you're like, nah, 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 this new boo is better it's a very interesting take, um, you know, from the from the OU side of things. I know there'll be tweets that you reference and things to that. that and we'll get into more details. But, I mean, look, you want optimism. And they can say to themselves, hey, the, you know, Big 12 preseason poll, I mean, they finished second. So there's no one in the, in the conference who follows them expecting a huge drop-off. They, that essentially means they expect them to be in the Big 12 championship game. But this team, you know, it enters this into the season with a, a lot of question marks, and I think more question marks than they've had in previous years. Well, I mean, the All-Big 12 team came out last week, and the only player that Oklahoma put on the team was its punter. So mm -hmm. it's a team that goes into this year without any elite players on paper other than the punter. And I think from an outside perspective – you know, you mentioned Lincoln Riley. Like, I think Oklahoma fans have almost taken for granted that he produced one of the best stretches of quarterback play in the history of the sport. You could probably go – I don't even know if it's going out on a limb to say that the Baker Mayfield to Kyler Murray to Jalen Hurts trio that, you know, what is that? It was like half a decade of quarterback play that was in – uh, New York at the end of each season where, you know, a 200 quarterback rating was kind of the new standard that was established. That quarterback coaching is gone. And if we look at last year, Caleb Williams was the player that Oklahoma had on its roster that made you think if something special is going to happen in Norman, it might happen because they have a special player at the quarterback position. You can say whatever you want to about Dylan Gabriel and how well he will do as a transfer from Central Florida this year, but he's not Caleb Williams. There's not a person on the planet that would make a – not even Dylan Gabriel's parents would trade him for Caleb – or they would trade him for Caleb Williams if they had a chance. So there's a short-term deal, but you mentioned referencing tweets. I saw earlier today Teddy Lehman – who is one of the best players in the history of the Oklahoma program. I mean, when you think about Bob Stoops and defense and Texas fans will forever remember Teddy Lehman as one of the players involved in the Roy Williams Superman play where he forces Chris Sims to throw the ball up in the air in the end zone back in 2001. And there's even 20 years later, there's still Teddy Lehman jokes. Teddy Lehman said on Twitter today that Oklahoma would win a national championship, not compete, not make the playoffs, not 
win the SEC or win the Big 12. They would win a national championship within three years because of the arrival of Brent Venables. And I'm just mystified by it all because I don't know what the hell they're looking at from a personnel standpoint. I do the same thing when Texas fans say crazy stuff like this. What are you guys looking at? Because it's not there. The talent on campus isn't there. And they're not recruiting at such a high level that anybody should be talking about national championship. I'm bewildered by the level of excitement because if it was me, I'd be really worried about the downgrade from a guy that has proven himself to be, you and I think, the best head coach in the Big 12. Had he, Were he still in Oklahoma? Oh, we yeah. would be talking about Lincoln Riley as a top five coach in college football. I still think you and I both think of him that way. Brent Venables is a little bit like Steve Sarkeesian. He's unproven as a head coach at the very highest levels. It's quite a leap to go from this guy's never coached a game as a head coach to he's going to win a national championship in less than three years. I know that Teddy Lame is not speaking for all of the Oklahoma fan base, but I get the sense that he's speaking for a large portion of it. I mean, he's got, as we record this on a Tuesday morning catch, I mean, so far there's 2,400 likes on the tweet. So, I mean, you know, by the time this thing is posted, you know, it's going to be, you know, somewhere, you know, probably 3,000, 4,000, maybe it's 3,500, 4,000. So that's a lot. Yeah. I mean, no one's shouting him down. No one's telling him, like, hey, man, where where are you coming from? Now, look, you know, catch me. If VY said the same thing, maybe he gets the same amount of likes as well, just because it's VY. So there, there is something to do with the name. It's just interesting, though, Catch, because you, you know, we got to have the conversation because first of all, you, you know, they lose obviously one of the best quarterbacks in the as co- quarterbacks, quarterbacks. But I'm about to start with the coaching in, in the country with Lincoln Riley. And let's just go through some of the guys that they lost in a transfer portal. I started with the quarterback situation, so of course they lose Caleb Williams and lost Spencer Rattler as well. And uh, but you know, Caleb Williams ends up being the bigger loss of the two going to USC. They lost Mario Williams, catch who is a damn good. Receiver receiver uh you know so they, they lose him to he goes to usc uh they also lost uh J, Jaden hazelwood uh you know who was also a very good receiver from them they go he goes over to arkansas uh, then they lose a, a bunch of other guys you know who were also in the mix you know they lose i thought austin stogner was the best tight end in the big 12 coming into the season if he sticks around for another year yeah so to lose him he goes to south carolina okay uh, they've lost, uh, you know, Latrell McClutchin. You know, he goes over to to USC, a uh, Southern Cal. You know, they lose a couple other guys like, you know, Cody Jackson. You know, that goes to U of H. But you know, you're starting to add up where you start to lose a lot in your your receiving room. Um, you know, Patrick Fields goes to Stanford. You know, they so you have the, they'll have those losses, and you can't necessarily say for 100 percent certainty the guys who are going to replace him are that much better. D- Dylan Gabriel will will be compared, you know, catch to 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 the, his predecessors and what they were able to do and what they were able to accomplish at that quarterback position at, at Oklahoma. Like fair or, or unfair, Oklahoma has a sta- established a, a standard of quarterback play and I don't think anyone's saying just be a game manager. No no one's placing Adrian Martinez like expectations on D- Dylan Gabriel, right? Adrian <laughs> Martinez, just, just go ahead and just be a little bit better than you were in Nebraska. We'll give you a little bit of a better of an offensive line, and we'll, I think you'll be good here. You know, you, he he's following in the Caleb Williams footsteps like that. That's a, that's asking a lot. You know, you've got Marvin Mims, um, who I think you and I like a lot. Um, but that's you know, an NFL have, player. Yes. Uh, but then you got Theo Weiss recover, coming back from a foot injury, and you, you got to see how he does. I mean, he he said that, you know, I think I read something, Catch. He said something like on a scale of 1 to 10, he's about an 11. So he's feeling pretty good, but he still has to recover. Obviously, you got to not recover, but you got to make sure he's at 100% and um, and ready to go. You know, and he's got to prove himself. I mean, that's a five-star kid 
that came in with a lot of acclaim and he's not yet lived up to the billing. It's weird. If you slapped Marvin Mims' ranking on Theo Weiss, you'd go, okay, that's about right. And if you'd slap Theo Weiss's ranking on Marvin Mims, you'd probably think, okay, they're living up to their, their rankings. I think the NFL drafted as much damage as the portal. When you think about, you know, mm. Kennedy Brooks is gone. They lost, they lost a lot of guys in a lot of different ways. There's a conversation to be had about are they the best team in the Big 12 this year? I don't think so, but I certainly think it's absolutely reasonable that Oklahoma would win a Big 12 championship this year. However, this Oklahoma has in a in a way has the same issue that Texas has. When it goes into the SEC, how ready is it truly going to be for the SEC? Venables is a defensive coach, but he doesn't have the personnel that Georgia and Alabama have. When we go back, when you go back and look every year when it's Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, um, Ohio State, those teams all typically have something in common. Most of them usually have elite quarterback play, whether it's Trevor Lawrence or any of the recent guys that either Ohio State or Alabama have had, right? I mean, both of those teams this year return arguably the best two players in college football. But behind all of that, there's tons of NFL talent. And behind all of that are lines on offense and front sevens on defense that are just full of men that shut down mere mortals playing college football. It is There's a reason why Oklahoma's been to the playoffs a number of times under Lincoln Riley and not been able to win a game. That This idea that within three years they'll be in a position to do that, who in the hell is going to – I just – I don't know who in the hell is going to be on the field for them that's – going to be at that level. I think that Texas and Oklahoma both throw the word playoff and national championship around very loosely. Texas fans do it after a five and seven season. I mean, you and I get questions every week. Do you think Mm -hmm. Texas will be in the playoff in the next three years? And it's like, guys, qualify for a bowl game first, compete for a Big 12 championship second, win a Big 12 championship third, get to the playoff fourth, (laughs) and then take that last monumental step. Oklahoma's been close, but I don't think they're as close as they've been in the last few years. They're closer than Texas is, mainly because of pedigree and the fact that even with a change of head coach, there's a a lot of guys in that locker room that have won a lot of games. But – These are both programs that are starting over to a certain extent. Texas starting over a year ago. I look at Oklahoma as a full-fledged reboot. New quarterbacks, new running backs, new almost everything. New defensive coordinator, new offensive coordinator. I don't really know what Oklahoma is going to be yet. Big 12 champion, maybe, but beyond that, it's, it's impossible for me to see that. Catch. I mean, here comes the, the the question I have for you. Do you think they're better than Baylor this season? I mean, if you had a choice, I'll give two two questions. Do you think they're better than Baylor? And if you had a choice between Dylan Gabriel or Spencer Sanders, who do you take? Well, I'm taking Spencer Sanders over Dylan Gabriel. Spencer Sanders is just a lot more proof. I don't think Spencer Sanders is elite of the elite. I don't even know that he's the best quarterback in the Big 12. But I would take him over Dylan Gabriel primarily because, you know, he led his team to a Big 12 championship game a year ago. Oklahoma State had a fantastic season. Dylan Gabriel's never played well against a ranked team before. I mean, he's a guy that beat up on the Minnows at Central Florida and struggled against elite, not even elite, just better competition. And I think that that will be the thing that I will be watching from him this year in the biggest games of the Big 12. Does he elevate or is he just a guy? And I think going into the season, Baylor has to be – look, Dave Aranda is more proven as a head coach than than Brent Venables. And they both 
are defensive minded guys. But I've seen I what I've seen Dave Aranda take high three star guys and compete at a really high level. But I, we're not talking about Baylor as a playoff team. We're not talking about Baylor competing for a national championship in three years. There's some really myopic views, self views of teams across the Big 12 with regards to how good they really are and how good they can really be. These teams aren't getting there until they start recruiting at really elite of the elite levels. Texas, I don't even think did that a year ago and they were a top five class and they have, it's not like they've been stacking classes yet. They've started to with, this year's class, which is starting to look like an Alabama or Georgia type of recruiting class, but it's just one. And Oklahoma's not there yet. They're just not. So, you know, think about Oklahoma. They haven't, I don't think they've had better than a top seven recruiting class mm-hmm. in the last 15, 20 years. Maybe one top five class. I, th- I want to say I was looking through the rivals rankings yesterday and came across one top five finish since 2004, 2005. Their average over the course of the last 15, 20 years is just outside the top 10. They're like typically somewhere between 7th and 15th, which means you're typically going to have a really good team, but you really have to stack that next level of recruiting classes, one on top of the other. Ask Georgia. It was not an easy climb for Georgia to win a national championship. It took several attempts, and it took a lot of recruiting classes stacked on top of each other to get to that point, and now they're there. Kind of the same thing for Nick Saban at Alabama. It it took a while before the machine was truly a machine, And I think both Texas and Oklahoma look at their programs through incredibly short windows. It's like, can can either of these coaches get their teams into the playoffs and then win a playoff game in the next few years? Well, the next few years eventually will include a move to the SEC. and, And that will take some adapting to. Like, it's no matter where they go, those teams have to get out of the SEC before they can get into the playoff moving forward. So potentially yeah. you're, you, both of these teams, if they get, if let's say they get out a year early, both Oklahoma and Texas, and they go into the SEC in 2024, to me that leaves a two-year window for them where they could most easily get into the playoff. It gets harder when they move to the SEC because suddenly they've got to be better than Alabama, Georgia, occasionally historically good LSU teams, Texas A&M. Everybody wants to scoff at Texas A&M, but they are stacking up recruits and recruiting classes in ways that Texas and Oklahoma still need to. I don't know. I, I struggle to think I know when the year is that both of these teams will be that good, but it's not before 2024 and it gets harder after 2024. I think both of these schools and their fan bases need to shut the hell up with these, my just win the big 12 this year. And at the, if you can do that at the end of the year, see where you stand. Do you have one loss? Do you have two losses? Can you sneak into the playoff? And then you've got to win a playoff game. Again, there are levels to this. And I I just, I find it funny that the fan bases of these schools don't realize how hard this is. Yeah, winning a natty is not easy. (laughs) You don't, it's not like an I-9 trophy where everyone just gets one. I mean, a natty, you know, it takes incredible, all the things fall into place. And it's interesting to, to think that we're, we're not talking about OU winning a natty coming out of the Big 12, but then that could happen in the SEC. That that That's a Without huge... Without any first-team all-Big 12 players, let yeah. alone first-team all-SEC. Correct. And, you know, and, and having to lay the foundation for, you know, right now, Catch, from a recruiting ranking standpoint, OU ranks sixth. 
uh, 16th, excuse me, uh, with five uh, four stars, a nine three stars, a 3.36 uh, average ranking, um, which you could probably speak to what that really means when you have like a 3.36. For instance, uh, o- Ohio State is at a 4.06. Notre Dame is at a 4. And, and Texas at a 3.75 as far as the average. And so you, maybe I'll just allow you to spend on that so people can get the, the understanding what that means. Well, it's, it's – they're doing they're, – how many commitments do they have? 14? Uh, let me go back down to it. They're they're in the double digits. They've got like fourteen or fifteen. If I'm not, they got five, fourteen. Four, correct. Yeah, five four stars and nine three stars. If I I think that's what you mm-hmm. said, but I think that's what I remember. Um, it's it's good. It's really good. It's really good, but it's not great, and it's not elite. And Oklahoma fans are really you know you know what happens. You start going on a recruiting run, and, and if you get a bunch of them all within a, you know, I think they picked up seven. I think this, the, the stat that I had the other day was seven commitments from the last three weeks, five of them in different states, five different states represented. And so you think, oh, we're winning, kicking ass and taking names. Only one of those guys had an offer from Texas. Mm. You know, most of the players that they've landed are – solid i think what's interesting in recruiting that oklahoma fans are not paying a lot of attention to in the history of the rivals let me give you a stat here on war in the history of the rivals rankings the state of oklahoma from 2004 till the present has produced two five stars and 11 high four star prospects so 13 elite of the elite prospects ever Ever, right? Mm -hmm. Oklahoma signed 11 of them. So you want to know how well Oklahoma has typically controlled recruiting in the state of Oklahoma. They've signed 11 of the 13 highest rated players that Rivals has ever given prospects. Okay. This year. Casey Thompson, one of the guys that got away, by the way? No, not elite of the elite. I think he was a mid four star, low four star. Okay. Uh, and and when you get lower than elite of the elite, it get it does get a little bit more wide open. Oklahoma State starts to get some USC, Tennessee, like everybody starts Texas. Everybody starts to get some of those type of prospects. But elite of the elite, Oklahoma has typically controlled the state of the five highest rated prospects in the state of Oklahoma that have given commitments so far this year. Oklahoma has none. It's weird. I mean, because the state of Oklahoma is on fire about Brent Venables, Mm -hmm. but recruits aren't. Recruits in their home state aren't. That and and four of those five all had Oklahoma offers. And of those four kids, they combined to take 12 visits to Oklahoma. And none of them committed to Oklahoma. And so again, it's just it's a it's just a weird. If it's me and I'm an Oklahoma fan, I'm probably just a little bit more reserved with what I think might happen with this program. Being optimistic, go for it. Being bold and like cocky is a step too far. And I feel the same way about Texas. So if like an Oklahoma fan watches this video, and thinks we're just ripping on Oklahoma. There's almost nothing that we're saying in this video about Oklahoma that we won't say about Texas. Or haven't said. Or haven't said a hundred times about Texas. And I just, I'm in a I don't know phase with Oklahoma football. And I feel like that's not where I've been for most of the last decade. I know what they've been. They've been elite in the Big 12. And then we know what happens when they get to the playoffs. They're not quite at that level, all 22 of their starters. They're dope. They've been dope at quarterback. I mean, Heisman winner, Heisman winner, Heisman finalist. And that will take you very far if you've got that guy. And if Caleb Williams is on this year's Oklahoma team, they're probably the favorite for me in the Big 12. They don't. 
They have Dylan Gabriel, and I can't say that I know when Oklahoma's going to win another conference championship. Not in the Big 12, not in the SEC. I feel the same way about Texas. I don't know when it's going to win its next conference championship. I think Oklahoma fans may be in for a rude awakening when they see what the rest of the decade has planned for it. And I guess that'll be my final comment. <laughs> well, the only thing I will say, catch one of my final comments is the one thing I've just I've learned about uh, OU. Even though we can have you know we have some questions, we'll see what Eric Gray does this year at the running back position, and like I talked mentioned receivers, and you know, we've got Deshaun White at the linebacker position, and some defensive tackles. They return. Uh, you know, three offensive linemen from last year's team, but I believe they gave up about 30 something sacks last year, 33 sacks. I don't know what that means, but you know, the other thing to catch when I look at this, you know, so there's, there's two things, the, the, the small, the big, small thing, small picture, big picture. But I look at the small picture, it won't stand on the table for any team in the big 12 this season. You yeah. know, I will say Baylor is, is, is the favorite and, and I can see that, but I'm not going to stand on the table for anybody. I'm not going to say that I'm convinced that this is going to happen. Like we haven't, it's not really often that we're seeing Oklahoma State going to back to back, you know, conference championship games. Amanda's got to show that this wasn't just a, you know, one year thing, but this can be something that's proven and, and, and stand the test of time. And so there is a part, though, that I'll say it is wide open. I, you know, I, I think Venables is a good coach. Anytime I've heard him speak, he's very, um inspiring motivating like i you know i'm not going to i'm not going to sleep on them and the only thing i will say is a cautionary tale this will be my final thought even though i everything i look and i was like i look at it on paper from the things that they lost to the transfer portal the draft what they have coming back and you know new st staff defense like i say man i don't know but catch, I, I was kind of on the fence about Lincoln Riley uh, a few years ago and, and what that was going to look like. And I thought to myself, hey, Tom Herman is the proven guy. He's the guy that's done it at Houston. And he's the guy that I think is going to give this this program the the advantage in this head to head kind of thing. And that, that the opposite happened, you know, outside of the one victory that that occurred. You know, oh, you pretty much did the damn thing. So the only thing I will say is. I won't count them out until they're out. You know, that that's my only thing. I, I, I'll just have to see them believing uh, because they are like the undertaker. I said this before, but they, they seem to be the undertaker where you think they're dead and then they pop out the coffin and look at you. So I'm not going to count them out yet at, at, you know, 100 percent. Now, overall, every OU fan who's made it this far, I still probably think we're both idiots. And that's fine, too. But I will just say um, I'm just I'm I. I'm, we don't know if Dylan Gabriel comes here and just, you know, his stats and numbers at UCF are pretty damn good. So we don't know if he comes in here and, and has a great connection with Marvin Williams and Theo E stays healthy and Eric Gray starts, you know, performing at a high level and his defense comes together in a new defense quarter. Like, we don't know. Um, it doesn't look that way. That national title, now I, now that one, I'm, I'm definitely not going to, you know, I'm not, I'm not predicting anyone from a national title perspective, uh, but as far as Big 12 is concerned, I think it's anybody's race at this moment. Yeah, 100% agree with you there. I mean, it would not surprise if Oklahoma wins the Big 12 championship this year. The conversation, though, is about being something bigger than that. Yeah. It's about under Venables taking the next step that, that Lincoln Riley wasn't able to take. From my perspective, I don't see better personnel that exists right now than we've seen in previous years at Oklahoma. This is not a more talented 2022 Oklahoma team than 2021, and they didn't win the Big 12 championship in 2021. It wouldn't surprise me if they win it all in the Big 12 this year. It's this idea, though, that they're going, that this is a program headed for greatness on the bigger, wider college football scope. It's hard for me to see that, although I think the point you made is one of the best ones in this video. Oklahoma gets their head coaches right. I mean, That's Bob true. Stoops was an assistant coach, and he proved mm -hmm. to be a Hall of Famer. Lincoln Riley was an assistant coach, and he has proven to be what you and I think is a top five head coach in college football. Brent Venables has zero head coaching experience, but Oklahoma, I guess there are two ways to look at it. They always get it right. Or maybe they're due once to not get it right.
Mm. Leave your comments in the comments section. How close is Oklahoma, not to winning the Big 12, to legitimately competing in the playoff and winning a national championship? I think there's a better chance that they don't make the playoffs for the rest of the decade than they do. But if they do, it probably happens in the next couple of years before they make it to the SEC. Again, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments in the comments section. Um, for myself and Anwar Richardson, we'll have more videos throughout the week as we get ready. I don't know when he's leaving, but Anwar literally might leave on his way to Arlington as soon as we stop recording this video. He's got work to do, places to go, people to see. So uh, until later tonight, depending on when you see this video, we'll have a live show. Anwar will be live tomorrow. Lots of stuff here on the Orange Bloods Texas Football Channel for the rest of the week, all the way through the, the entirety of Big 12 Media Days. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon. Later.